All right, greetings from the dark continent. Conscious Caracol Hill, Adams van Sel, and the well, I would almost say this evening, but uh, this afternoon, I'm speaking to Mark Oppenheimer, the arch nemesis of BLF's Andile. And he's going to be talking to us about specifically the law angle to this whole uh, lockdown, but also uh, you as a South African, uh, what you need to know about some basic things in terms of privacy and maybe uh, how you can, how the constitution or the law can defend you in this time where they are soldiers and uh, in the streets and a heightened police presence. Uh, welcome, uh, Mark. Well, thanks for having me. Hmm. So basically, the, the who you are is already in the description, but maybe just for people who don't know, can you just give a very small, like, elevator pitch in terms of uh, who you are and what your background is? Sure. So I'm an advocate at the Johannesburg Bar. Um, my practice tends to specialize around constitutional issues, so I do a lot of work around um, the difference between free speech and hate speech, um, and then a lot of constitutional property law as well. So I've done submissions to Parliament on the question of expropriation without compensation. Um, recently, I've just produced a report um, on the rights um, that we have as citizens um, and how they're being limited uh, during the lockdown by the regulations um, and sort of the framework that operates to allow such limitations. And we can speak about that in more detail. Hmm. So, well, seeing as I'm, I'm assuming you're, you're working from home, but are our courts functioning in any capacity at the moment? Are they open? Uh, what is the situation there? Yes, so I'll say this, which is that originally the courts basically made themselves available only for urgent matters um, and matters relating to um, to COVID um, and try to restrict as much access as possible. What we're seeing now is uh, a realization that we have to try and get to some sort of normality with regards to, to the functioning of justice um, and then find measures to kind of keep that safe. So courts have actually been incredibly good at adopting digital measures. So luckily enough in Joburg, we have a system called case lines, which allows all matters to proceed digitally. And so we put in structure in advance. So uh, lawyers uh, generally are very conservative and very uh, tech phobic. So a lot of my colleagues were quite resistant. Um, I've been running the digital practice for about five years now. So I run all of my matters um, off a Dropbox folder and an iPad. Um, and so it sort of helps being a little bit ahead of the curve. But the idea is that, you know, you don't really need to have people trafficking in and out of a court with these big bundles of physical documents. Um, it's become much easier for us to share information digitally. And the idea as well now will be that hearings can either be done on paper only, so the parties can submit um, uh, all their affidavits and their argument about what the outcome ought to be, and a judge can decide on a desk. Um, but there's also the option of having an open court hearing, which is not necessarily in court. Um, but is open another way, which is done digitally. So I saw this morning that um, in Port Elizabeth, they have been uploading their um, their matters onto YouTube. So people can watch in as they would as members of the public gallery, being able to see what's happening in our courts. And advocates can sit at home and they can present arguments. And uh, in this particular case, the judge was in a physical court. But courts are interesting in that they're, they've always been conceptual. So we've had a system for a long time where you can run an urgent matter and some matters are incredibly urgent. So you can imagine, for example, that um, you are about to be um, kicked out of your home um, by the sheriff unlawfully um, and you're going to face a, you know, you know, destitution. You could go to, to an urgent court judge um, and you could convene a hearing and that hearing could either be in the judge's house um, you know, late at night um, or it could be done over the telephone. So we've had a history of being able to have court hearings outside of court. Um, and so I think it's a good sign that courts are going to be doing this generally. There's also a recognition that this will have to happen, you know, beyond the lockdown. Uh, the directives that I've seen from the SCA, I think are up until August, that they'll have um, hearings done uh, through video conferencing and, you know, other courts are sort of following suit. Hmm. No, but that's very interesting because now that you say that there's a conceptual level to the to the court, basically, don't you think that in the future then that this might be adopted in certain cases where uh, it, uh, court cases are done outside of the court? Or is there something actually very necessary in terms of conducting a court case or doing a court case within the, the court context itself or the building itself? Yeah, it's interesting. So um, 
one of the things that that was done in in Johannesburg a while ago was um, so you'd, you'd have people who are imprisoned um, who would bring applications um, you know while in prison um, and part of why they would do it was you could have a day out you know I think being in prison is a horrible thing uh, a lot of us have some sense of what it's like to be you know um, forcibly put in one location and so you bring an application you get a day out in court um, and and part of it might be let's say a day out even if you're going to lose part of it might be it's a very good escape opportunity so in Joburg there were a number of um, quite quite vicious cases of um, shootouts in the court foyer with escaped prisoners and police and things like that and so what was done was to basically put um, a video conferencing system in place so that someone who wanted to access a court because you might have your rights being violated you might have a very good reason to want to access the court um, but that you could do it from the prison facility through a video conference and that, that could be then be seen by everyone in the physical court there's a another kind of reason that courts operate in the way they do which is very formal which is to kind of create an aura. So we we all wear these funny outfits in court. So I wear robes in court. Um, mm. We have very formal modes of address. You know, my lord and my lady. Um, that we sort of, you know, when we enter court, we bow to the institution of the court. There's all this kind of formality, and it does have a certain magic to it. So you find, for instance, that you know you can have two parties who are warring with each other and cannot see any way that they could agree, and on the day uh, they find a settlement. Um, that there's an aura of this building of this authority of all these people dressed up like penguins that suddenly makes people think, well, I'm not sure if I want to be cross-examined in a public gallery. Um, maybe I should see see reason and try and negotiate. So there's something to be said for that. Um, and it's unclear whether we'll see that that happen in the sort of digital forums. But the practicalities, the being able to, you know, raise arguments, um, there's no reason why that can't be done, you know, um, on a video conferencing thing. And also, in some ways, it might make it even more public. So, you can have a live stream um, of a court proceeding that can be, you know, um, viewable. We've seen more and more of that over time. For you know, the Oscar case is probably the first one where the country got gripped by by litigation on a very ongoing basis. And the beauty of that is that people kind of get a sense of what are our courts like? What does justice look like in action? What would it be like to be, you know, in a criminal matter? Um, and we see that with some other cases. I think um, you know, court reporters have gotten much more interested in big litigation, some of it around Zuma. Um, but I think having deeper access into other matters, constitutional matters, um, matters of other public importance is quite important. I think as we see more and more challenges to these regulations, I think it's quite important for the public to be able to view um, what's going on in our courts. And the idea of that being made publicly available, I think, is going to be you know, really important for proper citizen action. Well, uh, speaking of uh, cross-examination, here's a question in the chat for you, Mark. Uh, Sideline Opinions asks, uh, would you like to do a cross-examination virtually? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting thing. I mean, so we have a whole bunch of rules around cross-examination. Um, one of the rules is that um, when a, a witness is under cross-examination, that they cannot confer with their legal team. Um, so you could imagine that it would be easier to breach those kind of rules if you've got a video conference that you could have someone having a side chat. But we sort of expect, you know, counsel to sort of abide by the ordinary principles that have been in place. But I think there's no reason why you couldn't do it, um, why someone can't testify digitally. You know, um, you've got a record of it. They're under oath. Um, you know, you, you can absorb all the protocols. Um, so, yeah, I think there's no reason to sort of let our current circumstances impede the flow of justice. Mm. Well, I think a, a lot of innovation is going to come from this time as well, where people realize, uh, like we talked about uh, off, off air, uh, how many meetings could have been emails. And I think uh, a lot of people are going to realize uh, how many facets of everyday life, and including, I think, uh, things that pertain to the law, could have been uh, actually facilitated uh, by te using technology. And I would just like to use the, uh, this opportunity to thank everyone that's tuned in so far. Thank you for your, you can send your questions in the chat if you want and uh, leave a like if you like the stream so far. But thank you for tuning in, guys. This is a strange time, but uh, so Ramaphosa is talking tonight. So it's not going to be a regular thing to, to stream at five. But uh, yeah, thank you for tuning in. Now, the next thing I want to know is, seeing as now the military has been deployed, we have a very large police presence everywhere. 
as a regular South African, what rights do you have in this regard? Can the what part and what powers do the police and the, the military have? Can they, for example, go onto someone's property and force them to take, for example, a COVID test? Yeah, it's a good question. So uh, I think we should be a little alarmed at the idea of the full deployment of, of the military. It's the first time that we've had this kind of deployment um, since the elections in 1994. Um, now, let me just give you an idea of our, our framework and how it works. So we have not declared a state of emergency, which means that the constitution is fully operative. Um, all of the rights that you have in the Bill of Rights are there. Um, there is a clause in the Constitution called Section 36, which is our limitations clause. And the idea is that you can limit a right in the Bill of Rights if it's reasonable and justifiable in an open and democratic country. So, for example, one of the rights that is most obviously being limited is our freedom of movement. Now, um, we can, if we look at what's being done around the world, we can see that many countries have adopted these quite strong restrictions on freedom of movement. Um, and so we must ask, well, what's the underlying rationale? Well, it's to prevent the spread of the disease um, and to save lives. And the, the idea of saving these lives, um, you know, also has economic consequences. So, you know, if we lose a lot of people that are involved in the economy, that'll have long-term economic suffering. Um, but similarly, we know that when you restrict movement and you restrict business operations, that has very direct economic consequences, which will eventually translate into health consequences. So when we use that limitations analysis, there has to be this kind of rationality inquiry as well, which is to work out, well, what is the purpose of the limitation? Is there a less restrictive means of achieving that purpose? Um, and, you know, can it ultimately be justified? So the way that we sort of, the way that our, our rights are being limited at the moment is through regulations passed by ministers. So what you have is an act, the Disaster Management Act, which provides um, powers to ministers to kind of produce the subordinate legislation. Now, the way to challenge that is through what we call a, a, a PAJA challenge. PAJA is the Promotion of Administrative Justice Act. Um, and we sort of see that when a minister does that, they're, they're using their power. And they must use their power in a way that is uh, justifiable. They can't exceed the powers that they have in the Constitution, and they can't exceed the powers granted them by the Act. And when they have limitations, they must be reasonable. Okay, so let's look at the example that you give. So uh, the regulations say that no person can refuse to be tested, um, isolated or quarantined if they have COVID, are suspected of having COVID, uh, or have been in contact with someone who has COVID. Okay, so this happened er early on. There was someone whose family members tested positive, and uh, he said, I'm not, I'm not getting tested, um, and I'm not submitting myself to, to isolation. And so uh, a warrant of arrest was sought, so the person could be contained. Okay. Um, now you might think, in other words, if you have someone who knows that they're positive and who then becomes a super spreader, um, and and there were cases of this abroad of people who knew and then deliberately went out to public gatherings to go and infect others, that you have reason to contain that person. Okay. There's another class of people which are those that. Um, have it, would like to isolate, but don't have the capacity. So you could be a poor and vulnerable person who lives in a dormitory with lots of other people and um, could do with a safe haven where you can be isolated and looked after by the state. Okay. There's a third case, though, which is those people that have the ability to self-isolate and have the will to self-isolate um, and nonetheless can be forced into a, a government quarantine camp by the state. So in Limpopo, a couple of weeks ago, there were two doctors who said, um, we are positive, but we have the capacity to, um, to look after ourselves at home, and that's what we intend to do. And the premier in Limpopo said, no, um, we are going to forcibly place you into quarantine. We've also seen more recently statements like this made by the MEC for Health in Quizzle Natal, saying that people will not be allowed to um, self-isolate, all right, and that they'll be forcibly placed into quarantine camps. Now, so let's think about the rationale. The rationale of this regulation is that you want to try and stop the spread of COVID. Does it do that? Well, to my mind, it's, it's irrational for a couple of reasons. First of all, if you tell people that they will be forced out of their houses um, into a quarantine camp uh, if they test positive, well, there's very good reason then that they'll stop voluntarily testing themselves. Now, we know that one of the ways that you combat this disease is by getting good data. And it really does require people to voluntarily test themselves. Most of the tests that have been performed are performed in the private sector. 
So lots of people who think, well, I've got a symptom, let me go get tested, are doing that on a voluntary basis. They're not being forced into testing. So all of those, a lot of those people will say, well, I'm not going to get tested if it means that I'm going to be dragged out of my home. So you undermine the purpose. The other one is that if you take people who are able to self-isolate and you put them into a government quarantine camp, you're depriving people in categories one and two from a bed. So the person who says, I, I, I need a bed, I don't have one, I, I live with all these other people and I don't want to get them sick, please put me into the government quarantine. Well, he might not have a bed available for him because you've taken the person who could self-isolate and given the bed to them. So there are only so many resources available and depriving those that need the resources um, seems is irrational. So I think there's that problem. There's also a fundamental basic liberty, which is you have a right not to be um, detained against your will. It's a constitutional right. you know. And really what you're doing when you forcibly quarantine someone is you're interfering in a fundamental right. And if you do it without any just reason, well, you know, then it cannot survive a Section 36 analysis. So it, it, it's, it strikes me as, as quite dangerous um, and something that I think people should be you know, uh, concerned about. Hmm. And, well, on that topic, you're probably familiar with this. I'm just going to put it on the screen. Let me just check here. Uh, this. All right. Just there we go. So you're pretty much probably familiar with this, that Afri Forum is today threatens legal action over forced quarantine in state camps. And this is um, this is from KZN. So uh, lobby group Afri Forum has asked the Minister of Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs uh, to overturn a direct a directive forcing people to who test positive for COVID-19 to be held in government uh, quarantine camps. Is there any substance in this in this legal challenge or what are your thoughts here? Yeah, I would think so. Um, I think that's a, it's going to be very important for civil society generally to look at those regulations uh, that are an overreach. Um, I think this is the right approach, which is to first of all express the concern, um, give uh, the Ministry of Cooperative Governance an opportunity to revise um, what they are thinking. So in other words, the minister does have the power to, to make uh, changes to, to regulations. I would think, for example, one way of solving the problem would be to put in a proviso which basically says that those people that are able to self-isolate um, will be given the option to do so. Uh, that seems like a, a reasonable way of doing it. Um, and then you don't have the problem of people being forced into, into state camps um, and depriving people of, of resources. So I think it'll be interesting to see what the, the state response is to this. Um, but I think if, if the state doesn't uh, respond favorably, then I think litigation is going to be quite important. Hmm. But let's say now a regular South African finds themselves in this situation. Can they, for example, say that they first want to speak to their lawyer before being forcefully moved to a quarantine camp, or do they have no say in the matter, in the matter and they just have to comply? Yes, yeah, so you do have a, a constitutional right to, um, to seek legal counsel. Um, and, you know, I think it's, it's vitally important that people are able to do that, they're, that they're able to get to court as well. So if someone, for example, is dragged out of their homes and taken to a quarantine camp, um, you know, they're basically being detained without trial, um, uh, you know, against their will. And so it's important that they be given an opportunity to challenge that um, and either to challenge their particular uh, circumstances or to challenge the regulations themselves. Now, something that I've also thought about uh, come, leading up to this, I've actually sp spoken to some people about it because I think it's a fascinating thing to explore, is that already we have a, a society where people feel very strongly about their personal freedoms, they care about what they, they don't want the state to force them to do anything against their will, especially things that infringe on, uh, on their religion or their culture. Now, what, let's say a hypothetical person uh, says that they, let's say now the, the vaccine for COVID-19 is developed and now uh, people are getting vaccinated and it's mandated that everyone do so. What would the, the, would there be a case for someone that says, but this goes against my culture or my religion or against my own personal, uh, it's not against my personal decision and they decide to not uh, get the vaccine or would this person have absolutely no ground to stand on? Well, I think we can sort of think about other examples where people have asserted um, their their rights to belief um, and there's been a clash with health. So one of the classic cases is uh, Jehovah's Witnesses. So they believe that um, receiving a blood transfusion um, is a serious breach of their religious convictions. 
Um, and so what we found in cases around the world is where uh, Jehovah's Witnesses have a sick child um, who requires a blood transfusion to survive and would survive if they were given it. And they refuse. Um, they tell the hospitals not to grant the blood transfusion. It would be better for their child to die. Now, um, in Commonwealth countries, there is uh, this view that courts are the upper guardian of all minors. And so courts have had to do this, this balancing act to determine, well, how much do we respect people's religious liberties and um, how much of it is uh, you know, our job to protect the lives of the young? And you find that in a lot of those cases that courts have stepped in and said, well, um, it is in the best interest of this child to live. Um, now, it gets more complicated, for example, when you have an adult who says, well, um, I am making a choice not to be vaccinated. Yeah. Um, now, it's not the same as, in other words, denying a blood transfusion, which only affects you. The thing with the vaccine is it protects you, but it also protects others. Um, so we found, for example, that um, there's been a, a big anti-vax movement in parts of the States. Um, some people are religiously motivated. Um, and we've had a resurgence of some diseases that we thought had kind of been wiped out. And it's not just that they pose a risk to themselves, they pose a risk to other people. So we saw big measles outbreaks a couple of years ago happening in like um, in Florida, Disney World, and places like that. So there what you might have is this balancing act that courts have to sort of achieve between saying, well, how important are religious liberties? And we do have in our constitution a, a right to, um, you know, to, to believe what we want um, in terms of our religious, you know, religious convictions. Um, but you might step beyond belief when you start to harm other people. And so I think it's an open question and an interesting question. Um, but it's, it's, it's one of those things that does require some level of value judgment and also some level of evidence. So if we have a sense that, you know, people refusing vaccinations could cost, you know, many hundreds of thousands of people their lives, well, we might want to um, sacrifice their religious liberties. But if the, if the harm is very, very minor, we might want to respect their religious liberties. Right. But now, for example, let's say uh, actually something very relevant to some fake news that was spread here in South Africa with the whole Bill Gates thing uh, that was spread by News24, where they said that Bill Gates said that he wants to test, I think, vaccines on South Af or on Africans. And now let's take that, for example, and let's say people saw that message and now they are very paranoid and scared that uh, this vaccine might be created to harm them or they f they're feeling that this vaccine might not might actually uh, not benefit them in any way as part of some plot. That person, they can't, and let's say there's no religious motivation, there's no cultural motivation, they are just terrified about this fact that this vaccine could be malicious uh, or not as benign as they say it is. Does that person, if you remove the religious and the cultural aspect, does that person have any... Uh, any legal ground to stand on, or would that just be a, a, a very complex case? It's an interesting question. So um, we have a, some level of neutrality around belief. So, for example, when we look at a religious belief, um, you know, the question is whether it's sincerely held, but it doesn't have to just be a religious belief. It could be um, another kind of belief, and it could very well be a false belief. So, as you say, the person says, well, I believe that... Um, Bill Gates is doing this through, you know, to further his evil agenda, or really there's some hidden microchip in the vaccines, and there's no good evidence for any of that stuff. Um, you might want to be able to interrogate the underlyingness of the belief. Of course, in the religious case, it gets very hard to interrogate. So if you say, "Well, um, the deity that I worship would prefer it if I, you know, didn't eat this food or didn't go through this medical treatment," there's no verification mechanism for that. There's just the sincerity of the belief. Right. So then something else uh, that really uh, I think a lot of South Africans are feeling it not in their in their pockets or in their wallets, but maybe in their stomachs and in their lungs is this booze and smokes ban that we're seeing in South Africa. And it's not really we can't really say that we are following the, the data or the herd or the global consensus, seeing as this is a very uh, a unique approach, actually, that we're seeing here, uh, banning the sales of alcohol and, and uh, cigarettes. What are your thoughts on, on this regulation? Is there any validity or substance to it, or is there something else maybe behind it? Yeah, so let's let's think about what could be uh, a motivation. So one is we sort of started off, and we've seen this around the world, is um, closing down bars, 
Okay. And so closing down a bar makes sense because people congregate at the bar. Uh, you've got a crowded place. Um, it seems like a vector for the disease. Okay. So we've got a good reason to do that. Same way you might want to close down restaurants. You've got all these people congregating or sporting events or whatever it is. So we don't think there's anything intrinsically wrong with drinking or eating or playing sport. Um, so, but we don't want people gathering. So that's the reason. And then what we do is we go a step further and we say, well, you can't, you can't go and buy alcohol to drink at home. Now, it's drinking at home doesn't cause any kind of public gathering. So we found other rationales that have been given to us by the state. So one of them is that if you live with someone who drinks, they might get violent when they drink uh, and they could perpetrate an act of domestic violence. So we should stop it for that basis. Uh, the other one is to say, well, um, when people drink, they get into fights with each other um, or they, they get drunk and they drive and they get into, get into car accidents. And so we need to have this prohibition um, to save those lives. But bear in mind, in a pre-COVID world, all those things were there too. Um, in other words, people used to get drunk and they would get into bar fights and they would kill each other and they'd beat up their wives. And we stomach that risk because we think it's important for people to be free um, to make some bad choices. And to the extent that you intrude on someone else's rights, well, then we prosecute you. If you go and beat up your wife, we prosecute you. Um, we don't try and ban the alcohol. Here's the other problem is it's not like it's a new idea. The Americans banned alcohol for all these virtuous reasons in the 20s. Yeah, the um, noble experiment. Yeah. So you think, okay, well, you know, drinking's bad and has all, it, you know, leads to all this vicious behavior, so let's just ban it. Practically, it's very hard to ban it. So what you find is that people then find a way. Um, and so you can't get it, you can't get your alcohol through a normal network. So you have to get your alcohol through a criminal network. Um, that criminal network now has all this money flying into it uh, from all these people who before would not have dealt with you because you're a criminal. And so you found that prohibition was the best thing possible for organized crime in America. You know, these huge syndicates could, could develop. Um, and I gather that's what's happening in South Africa at the moment. So we had a, you know, an issue with cigarette smugglers before. Um, we had all these unlicensed cigarettes and people would have said, well, I don't want to deal with, you know, these, these crooks. I'm going to go buy my cigarettes from the store. You know, you have to pay a bit more and pay my taxes. Now you say, well, I can't buy my cigarettes and I'm an addict. I, I really have to smoke. So now I'm going to go and seek out one of these crime laws and buy my cigarettes from him. So you're not stopping smoking. Um, you're just, you know, channeling the money to a criminal network. So there's that consequence of the consequence. And I'm sure we're seeing that happen with alcohol as well that people are finding a way um, and you wind up supporting people that you don't want to support. So, you know, prohibitions are very, very hard to enforce and have all these other secondary consequences. You know, I think when you regulate, you know, often what you have is a short-sighted approach. Government can see the immediate target of the regulation says, well, that's a good thing. We should therefore regulate. But they don't see the secondary and tertiary effects of the regulation. Um, and so that's why these things are often going to be uh, irrational. And yeah, like I said uh, on Twitter as well to people that say, no, it's a good thing. I say, well, people, if they're not getting their, their alcohol from tops, they're just going to get it from the dark alley. And that alcohol is probably not going to be uh, the safe regulated version that you can get uh, from uh, legally. It's probably going to be uh, contain some some dangerous stuff, probably. And also not even talking about uh, the dangers of pretty much uh, home brewing without knowing what you're doing. Uh, I think there are also some things there that can go wrong that can actually you know, maybe not kill you, but uh, cause some serious discomfort. Um, Mark, there seems to be someone here that wants to play a board game with you. MJ says, Mark, when are we doing board games again? Good vibes. <laughs> yeah. Um, so some of you will notice that I'm a, a board game fan. There's a whole bunch of physical board games behind me. Um, I love board games. They're a, they're a sort of interesting way of not being in front of a screen, sitting with your friends, um, doing something social that's mentally stimulating. Um, most people, when they think of board games, think of the stuff that they had to endure when they were little kids, like uh, Monopoly and Risk, and those things took hours and were kind of a little random. You, know, you have people who say they're really good snakes and ladders players. Well, snakes and ladders is, is not a game. You're rolling dice and things happen to you. It's a ride. But modern board games are great. Um, they're really a, a cool way to kind of you know test your brain out. So I have been um, playing with friends online. There's a, um, Steam has a whole bunch of games available, and you can sit on a Discord channel and uh, kind of socialize in a way that, that works and still stretch your brain. So I, I encourage people to do it. Yeah, I see. Uh, uh, well, I just missed it now. They were, someone gave a suggestion on something that you can get uh, on Steam, uh, like some type of board game. Uh, 
we see. Oh, here it is. Tabletopia on Steam says MJ uh, is something you can try. I don't know if you're familiar, Mark. Yeah, so there's there's a couple of yeah, there's Tabletopia and um, I think it's called Board Game Simulator that creates that virtual world. So you have a kind of 3D table and you can move pieces around and things like that. Um, I, I'd say that, and they have like massive, massive collections of games. Um, I think Tabletopia is free and has a bunch of free games. Um, Tabletop Simulator, um, I think costs a couple hundred bucks and the other games are free. Um, I'd say for people who are a bit new to board games, the other ones are a bit more automated. Um, so um, there's a game called Lords of Waterdeep that's quite fun, um, easy to learn, um, kind of a classic Euro game. So there's this, <laughs> you want to go down a little geeky rabbit hole for a second. Um, there's this uh, distinction between what they call uh, Euro games and Amero trash games. So Amero trash games are like these dice chuckers. Um, they're all about killing your opponents, um, very luck driven. And Europeans are very polite, you know, so they don't want to like hurt anybody because, you know, they know what they did during the Second World War. So they, uh, instead, you want to just, you want to be passive aggressive. So you deprive people of opportunities. So those Euro games are a bit more strategic um, and sort of, and bitchy in a way. Um, and so there's some some really great versions of that stuff that you can play on Steam that's sort of easy to learn. And I, I'd, I'd, I'd recommend that while, while worth looking at And cheap. Some of these games are like a dollar. Mm. Well, uh, now that we've taken a break from the more serious, heavy stuff that we were talking about, I think taking a breather is very necessary. Um, the thing that I'm actually very curious about is the whole question of constitutionality. And I know you have a very specific interest in the constitution and constitutional law. Is there some type of threshold, a time for the th th uh, threshold that we can, that we will reach where this lockdown or this uh the state of lockdown that we are in will become constitute we can be challenged constitutionally is there anything like that uh, down the pipeline yes so i think if you think about um some of the measures that we're taking to limit our economy for example at early on you might think these are reasonable things to do um and there are justifiable things to do to stop the spread of the disease and you've got a certain amount of economic rope available to you so you can sort of you know, businesses can contract a little bit. They can sort of take a bit of a beating uh, during this time. But there comes a time where it stops being reasonable. You do it for long enough and you die from the thousand cuts. Um, and so, as I say, when we, when we talk about reasonable limitations, those must be guided by facts. Um, and, you know, the facts that we're going to have from business shutdowns are, you know, lots, lots of um, hungry bellies. Um, and and that, that hunger and that unemployment Will lead to social unrest and it will have health consequences people will will die um, we'll have violent clashes with the army um, and if the purpose of these lockdowns is ultimately to save lives um, it can start to undermine it and become unreasonable so we, we may find that some of the measures are already unreasonable i think one that people will will, will strike as as just absurd is this prohibition on grocery stores selling cooked food or cooked hot food so Again, you think about the rationale, which is, okay, restaurants, um, we should close them down because people are going to gather at them. Okay, restaurants sell hot food, so we shouldn't allow grocery stores to sell hot food. There's a, there's a logical error there. The question must always be, does this measure stop the spread of the disease? And whether you buy a hot chicken um, from Woolworths or a cold chicken is neither here nor there. Um, also, you've got to accept that, you know, when you've got a lot of these emergency workers, guys who are, you know, on the front lines, they might not have the time to go and cook their food. Having a you know a pre-prepared meal available easily is going to be an absolute lifesaver for these guys. And you know, to my mind, it's the kind of thing that you really want to allow. And the way that that's accelerated, um, you know, there were sort of you had by fiat, um, you know, the, the police sort of saying, if you sell hot food, we're going to confiscate it or stop you from doing it without any law enabling to do so. When this was pointed out to them, they then changed the regulation. Instead of stopping and considering, well, is there any purpose in this? You know, the purpose starts to look pernicious. Mm. What you must ultimately recognize as well is that, you know, no matter how big the army is, no matter how big the police is, practically you cannot, you cannot keep 60 million people behind bars. You know, the state must govern practically by consent. And if the people no longer have a belief that the state is legislating in their interests or doing things that are rational, they will revolt um, and you will not be able to keep them under control. So these little things like depriving people of, you know, a pot cooked food for no reason um, 
will, will lead to much more serious consequences down the line because there might be some reasonable measures that people are, you know, they're willing to abide by, but if they don't trust the state anymore, they won't abide at all and you'll have, you know, mass civil disobedience. Okay, so here's a question in chat. Uh, well, for both of us, Mark and CC, what is Afri Forum's official stance on the continuing lockdown and where do we go from here? Well, uh, I can answer that uh, just to put here something on the screen. Uh, let's see here. Uh, here we go, this. Hey, you're back. Yeah, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, okay, cool. I don't know, my screen just froze up there, strange. Anyway, um, so they were asking about Afri Forum's uh, stance. Let me just get that on here again, seeing as uh, I think the Cyril doesn't want me to, to get our message out there, it seems. Looks very suspicious. <laughs> All right, so here we go. Let's try again. Uh, let's just see. Okay, so I've opened all these tabs now. <laughs> Let's try and go okay, wait. Just okay. Uh, okay, perfect. There we go. And now share screen. Let's see if it wants to show that now. Yes. Okay. <laughs> and we're back online. All right. Uh, let me just see where's that. Okay, remove that. Cool. All right. So, uh, Afri Forum is part of the Solidarity Movement, and uh, Solid and Solidarity Movement uh, made a joint ad or a joint comment on the extension of the lockdown. So, as you can see here, um, Solidarity, the Solidarity Movement, which Afri Forum is part of, is very concerned with the the prolonged lockdowns effects that's going to have on our economy. So, for example, I think the, the big thing, and I think this is where Afri Forum's uh, stance is the strongest, it is that we should allow people to work healthily, that we need to be able to let people that are not at risk go back to work so that we can slowly get the economy going again. I, think, I don't think we have the luxury of thinking idealistically where we just have an a indefinite lockdown without any semblance of a, a type of economic recovery or getting people home. Oh, getting people to work. So I think this quote pretty much sums it up where um, uh, Flip Bass, the, the head of solidarity, says all work can be performed in a healthy manner. Uh, if uh, is it, Any work that can be performed in a healthy manner is essential work. If the economy isn't stimulated, it could lead to large scale job losses and social instability. So Afri Forum stance is pretty, pretty hard in terms of the, the extension of the lockdown, I don't think. Um, you would find that Afri Forum is in support of just completely keeping the economy on ice. I think that's a very dangerous um, the waters where we're moving in there. What are your thoughts uh, on this, Mark? Seeing as the question was directed at you as well. Yeah, I'll speak to it a bit more broadly. So I think a couple of organizations have been quite good about you know, thinking about this kind of arbitrary dis um, distinction between essential goods and non-essential goods. So it's kind of easy for us to imagine what an essential service is and what essential goods are. So we think, okay, well, the doctors need to be able to, um, you know, to, to operate and we need to have groceries and everything else is non-essential. We're not going to allow it. But we forget that, you know, for essential things to perform, they require a, a layer underneath them so they can operate. You need logistics companies. You're going to need financial services. And those people require people underneath them. You know, the economy is not segregated into essential and non-essential it's interrelated so what a couple of people have done is so i think the institute for race relations and sarka have, have said well the rational way of thinking about this problem is about risk um and it's about saying those industries that are able to operate safely should be allowed to operate and i'm hoping that we see more of that coming from government i, I gather it was sort of alluded to um, in Cyril's address the other night, uh, and I have seen a, a, a document floating around which implies that there'll be a move towards a risk model, and that shows the power of civil society. So, you know, I think organizations which are able to think about this thing properly and speak to those in business and speak to those in government to try and say, well, there, there, we have to have a bespoke solution for South Africa. Um, you know, and we have to do this in a rational, sensible manner. You know, hopefully we then see a kind of... Um, an economy which can open up and allow people to work in a manner that also helps protect lives. 
Mm. No, definitely. I think the I don't think that it's a very helpful to frame this whole debate in terms of you are a, a zero sum game where either you want people to die and on the other side you you just want to save lives. I think it's much more much more serious than that. I think we can we can actually find a middle ground where we still prioritize uh, mitigating the spread of the disease while still not completely freezing our economy to the point where we get frostbite and we might not get some of our, our limbs back after we get out of the the cryogenesis uh, fro frozen state. Um, I saw a, a question here. Uh, oh yeah, here for for Mark, but I think. Uh, this is pretty much what you just said in the previous uh, comment that you gave. Uh, please ask Mark, Mark his view on the long-term effects of this lockdown and the brutality of SAPS and the South African National Defense Force. I think the ANC are planning to make this a permanent reality to hold on to power. So is there anything else that you want to add to that thought, Mark? Well, look, the, the price of freedom is constant vigilance. Um, and I think any crisis creates an opportunity. It creates an opportunity for good actors and bad actors. So I think there are going to be people that are going to see this as an opportunity to gain power um, and that they won't want to relinquish that power. And that's something that we need to be you know, very wary of. So um, even if you don't think that the, you know, the ANC is a malicious organization, um, you know, once you grant people strong powers, uh, they become reluctant to hand them over. And so, you know, as citizens and a civil society, we need to keep an eye on that. Uh, I think the idea of moving to a kind of military dictatorship is an utterly frightening one. And so we must be very vigilant against that. You might think that some temporary uh, measures are okay um, and that they are reasonable, um, but they, they ought not to be there, you know, beyond the crisis. Um, and, and not all measures are justified by a crisis. So never going to be justifiable to have uh, brutal measures taken against citizens. You know, if you start shambocking people because they're sitting in their own gardens or, you know, drinking their home brewed beer, you know, there's, there's no justification for that. Um, so, you know, we, we need to kind of keep an eye on that. I, I think, you know, the worry is that people sort of become uh, overly obedient. In other words, they say, what, whatever the state says, we're just going to comply with. We're not going to ask any questions because we want to be on board with this. And, you know, now is not the time for critical voices. Well, now is the time for critical voices because once you have this, you know, this uh, opportunity to kind of grasp onto power, it can be abused. Um, and I think having lots of critical voices in the room is going to be very important. Also, being critical about uh, our sort of, uh, our way of thinking about this health problem is important. You know, you want to entertain minority views um, because they might be right. Uh, you want to hear, you know, from people who say unpopular things because they can help shift your perspective. Um, so I think that's quite important. I think, uh, as I say, we, we want to ensure that all of these, you know, um, draconian measures are completely rolled back once they need to be, and and that we allow measures so that our economy can operate and that our lives can kind of get to some level of tolerability while ensuring that our health system doesn't crumble. Mm. Well, here's a very good question in the chat. Uh, Sideline Opinions asks, uh, can people refuse to pay rent or school fees? Now, specifically, I think, just to reframe a little bit from specifically a legal angle, uh, would there be any substance to this where you have, for example, a person saying, well, I'm not, I don't have any income, I, I can't afford to uh, pay rent during this time. Uh, but then the person that is uh, renting them the building can make the exact same argument say, well, um, I can't just, uh, I can't survive by giving people a free, uh, uh, free residence because this is maybe a, a big chunk of that person's income as well, the person renting the house. Sure. Yeah, I, I think knowing what the, the reason is for the default makes a difference. So, for example, if someone says, I can't afford it, um, you know, that's not, not normally a good reason in law. Um, you know, people kind of go through, you know, imagine that, uh, you know, you rent your apartment from a landlord and you get fired. You couldn't say, well, you know, I don't get an income, so I'm not going to pay the rent this month. Um, but there are other kinds of rents that people might be able to legally avoid. So, for example, if you are prohibited from running your shop in a shopping center, you know, your contract might say uh, if there is, if you are unable to access the premises, well, then you're entitled to a remission of rent. So there might be a legal reason. Uh, the other one is uh, what we call force majeure or an act of God. So uh, there's a reason why you cannot, um, you know, perform your part of the contract. 
And so that may be something that people are able to rely on. But as you point out, there's there's no clear solution. There's only trade-offs. That if someone doesn't pay their rent, that has a negative impact on the landlord, which can have other negative impacts. Um, so I think what schools, I think some schools are trying to do is say, look, you know, uh, you know, we need to imp we need to keep our teachers employed. We can offer some services. We can you know teach your kids online, um, and you know they're going to need they're going to need some kind of revenue coming in so they can keep themselves going. Um, so yeah, there's also some kind of let's say moral element in it, um, which is you know do you think it's important to try and keep this thing subsisting? So a lot of people, for example, have not been able to have had their domestic workers come to their houses. But know that they're, you know, some of the most vulnerable people in society, um, and have continued to pay them. Um, and I think that's a moral thing to do. You know, it's a, it's a good thing to do. It's not clear that they have a legal obligation to do it. And now something else that also I think very important during this time, specifically, and not even just in South Africa. I think globally this is a big thing that needs urgent attention, or at least people to be vigilant is the whole matter of privacy and what the government is allowed to do and what they're not allowed to do. Because I think in a time of crisis, there's going to be a lot of uh, arguments surfacing that, no, but this crisis is a, uh, a unique circumstance. Therefore, we can uh, violate some of your privacy rights. For example, we have uh, in Australia, I think, I'm talking under correction, I think they are mandating now that you install an app on your phone that uh, will be used if you are infected to track who you came in contact with or whatever. But if, for example, in South Africa, there was also talks of now uh, increasing surveillance capabilities to make uh, pretty much to track people that are infected or to, to mitigate the spread of the disease. Um, are there specific things that you reckon that need that we need to be extra vigilant about when it comes to uh, privacy violations during this time? Yeah, sure. So um, if we look at our particular regulations, um, what it does is it allows um, the state to force internet service providers and cell phone companies to provide um, movement and tracking information about its customers. So that the purpose of that, as you say, is um, so that we can try and halt the spread of the disease. And it is used in China. So as you say, people have, have an app. Um, and uh, when you go to a public place, you you swipe a QR code and it shows you um, whether you are green, orange, or red. If you are green, the idea is that you are safe. You don't have the disease. If you are orange, you, you may be a risk. And if you are red, you know then you're more of a risk and you'll be disallowed from doing things. Now, there might be some sense of saying, well, you know, if we can allow those of us who know that we're safe to interact with each other, um, that this will be very useful. But... Obviously, the idea of doing this on a permanent basis is is profoundly scary. The idea that the state has, you know, total knowledge about your movements and your whereabouts and who you're in contact with, um, and we may very well find that, you know, once the uh, health crisis is over, that there are calls for these powers to be extended because states say, well, you know, generally we can save so many lives if we just know who you're interacting with, you know, and we could stop so many criminal networks if we could just get all their tracking data, you know. Um, so further reasons will be invented beyond the crisis to keep the powers in place. Uh, what we find in South Africa um, under our current regulations is that there has to be a judge who is able to, to find out who is being monitored, that if you are monitored, um, you must be informed of it um, uh, after the disaster is over, um, and that all of your personal information must be removed um, and must be deleted by the states. It can be used for uh, like academic inquiry if it's anonymized, um, but it can't be used after the fact. So there's some safeguards in place. Um, what's interesting is that one of the cases heard by the Constitutional Court uh, before the crisis was on RICA, um, which, which granted the state this ability to um, surveil people um, without any obligation to tell people that they'd been surveilled. Um, and um, it was quite apparent in that hearing that even the state itself thought that these powers were unconstitutional and indefensible. Um, so, yeah, I think it's definitely something worth keeping an eye on. And then also uh, talking about the whole privacy thing, do you think that, uh, well, uh, maybe let's uh, look a bit more in terms of what powers the government actually has. Do you think that, for example, if you look at how the, the president has handled this, the type of powers that has been granted to one individual, it seems, even if it's just uh, maybe just symbolic, 
what are your what is your impression so far been in terms of the oversight that we've seen the checks and balances the things that you just mentioned in terms of like safeguards to make sure that even in a time of crisis it is not exploited by the ideologically possessed or those that see an opportunity to grab power um so basically the the question is what is your impression been so far on those uh, checks and balances and uh, regulations that are in place for that specific reason Sure. Uh, I mean, we haven't seen that much pushback yet. So I think, you know, in, in the early days, people were very, very happy to, you know, have their, their rights taken away from them because they could see this goal ahead of them. And they could sort of see that we were making um, good efforts in in uh, in suppressing the number of infections. You know, that if you look at our, our testing data, it looks like our curve is flattening. So people were quite, you know, Quite happy with what was going on i think that's that attitude will shift over time um you know as people start to feel the pinch of lockdown um and as we start to see sort of social unrest increase we start to see you know um, food delivery bans being looted um, liquor stores being looted um you know schools being looted um you know and as people start to lose their livelihoods we'll see you know more and more discomfort i think as well we're going to see more and more civil society challenges so there'll be challenges to you know, abuses by the army and the police, and they'll be challenged to particular regulations. Um, at the moment, the early judgments I've seen come from courts, which were based around uh, freedom of movement. So, for example, I think early on someone brought a challenge saying that they wanted to attend a funeral, and they brought an application to court, uh, and the court decided that they wouldn't be allowed to, to go to that funeral. Um, but we may find that, you know, this is a unique time, and that, uh, you know, courts adjust their attitudes accordingly, and you want them to be evidence sensitive. So I think we haven't seen a sufficient check on power yet, um, but there's probably a lot going on behind the scenes as well. In other words, um, you know, various various groups trying to to lobby for why their interests should be should be taken into account at this time. Some of it for selfish purposes, but some of it's you know guided by evidence. Mm. And then I also see here in the chat, a uh, username says, uh, government is a non-essential service. Pausing the state's activity and expenditure for three weeks would benefit our economy more than the bureaucrats' recovery plan. Uh, yeah, well, uh, I wish we could run that experiment and see what happens. Um, but then today I read a headline that's actually quite concerning. Um, it's, it's said that if you are caught uh, breaking the lockdown rules, and you are fined for that, uh, you get a criminal record or there's a strong chance that you get a criminal record. Do you think that's a fair punishment? Uh, do you think there is some reason to this or is it uh, uh, actually completely uh, overreaction? Yeah, I suppose, you know, what you want to look at is the nature of the breach, you know. Um, so in law, we have this thing called de minimis. You know, if you, if you commit a, a crime, but it is such a, a minor crime that we don't punish you. So for example, if you uh, steal one cent from someone, you've committed an act of theft, but it is so minimal, that we don't think you deserve punishment. What's hard for us to work out now is what counts as de minimis. So if you're out in the streets walking your dog or going for a cycle, you know, you're in breach of the law. Um, you know, and the question is, is it de minimis? Well, ordinarily, we would definitely think those kinds of things are de minimis um, and definitely ought not to give someone a kind of you know, a criminal record. Um, what we may find is that uh, this this heavy-handedness um, backfires in some ways, um, and maybe what you'll have after the, the crisis over is people seeking to have their records expunged, um, so they you know they don't have you know the question around being able to, to immigrate or to um, you know find find new employment and having to have these you know these crimes on their record. Um, you know, you, a criminal record is sort of useful for knowing whether you've committed a, a very serious thing. If you've committed something, you know, that's a trifling. Well, it shouldn't be held against you. Hmm. Yeah, and here's another question that I think I can actually, uh, it touches on something that I wanted to ask anyway. So Benita asks, uh, please ask Mark what a person can do if they arrest you at a traffic stop. So I think how I would phrase this uh, is how, what can a person do uh, or what mechanisms are there or uh, paths are there for people that have been victims of abuse from the police or the, the army itself? What can you do as a regular citizen if that if you are if you unfortunately fall victim to uh, some type of abuse from from, from these authorities? Yeah, I think there's a couple of measures. Uh, one of the ones is I gather that AfriForum has set up um, a network for complaints, so that um, people can can write to AfriForum and say, look, you know, this abuse has occurred, um, so that it can be logged. Um, you know, one way of doing it as well is to complain to IPED, 
um, which is the the body that that sort of acts as a check on the police itself. Um, and in terms of a practical measure, in other words, if you are detained by the police, well, you know, you want to have access to to a lawyer who can you know get you out on bail um, and uh, you know ensure that you are that you are freed. So I think it's quite important that people have access to you know to attorneys um, you know on a on a regular basis. As I say, you do have the right uh, to consult with a lawyer, um, and you do have the right to be brought before a, a court if there's any kind of criminal matter brought against you within 48 hours. Um, there are 48 working hours, um, so there's sort of been a, a history of police sort of abusing this by arresting people on a Thursday, um, only to release them again on a Monday, you know, um, and do that to sort of punish them. And really, the, the purpose of arresting someone um, is not to punish them; it's to ensure that they appear in a trial. Um, and there are some regulations as well which dissuade the police from. Um, from detaining people for petty offences, um, that they should rather be you know, remanded um, and told to appear at court through through a paper notice as opposed to being physically detained. Hmm. And uh, I saw there was a, 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 chat, a question earlier in the chat uh, that I actually want to get to now. Someone asked, uh, can new civil cases be enrolled in the High Court uh, currently? Uh, yes, so initially there was a kind of freeze on this. Um, that new cases weren't going to be entertained. Um, I, I gather now that courts are going to sort of allow ordinary matters to proceed. Um, and uh, this is sort of going to be done. It's the, the way that the powers have been dealt with is that the Minister of Justice sets certain regulations. Um, some power was then given to um, the to, to, to Chief Justice Mahueng Mahueng, um, who's then delegated powers to particular courts. So what we're finding is that it depends which province you're in um, as to what the rules will be in that particular court. And it goes further in that particular judges have sort of said how they will deal with their matters. Um, but I think there's a recognition that, you know, life has to go on uh, and that courts must accommodate, you know, uh, these circumstances. People are still going to have financial disputes with each other. Um, they're going to need those disputes resolved. Um, and that courts must be available for that. Um, and that there's no reason why you can't initiate through some sort of digital mechanism. You know, the idea that you have to go and drop off papers with a sheriff, you know, we might find is a kind of uh, outmoded way of dealing with things and probably has been for years. Mm. Yeah. And uh, then the big question, uh, really, that I think uh, a lot of debate and speculation uh, has been going on uh, for the past few weeks, or I think I'm, I'm losing track of how long now, is really what this whole lockdown and the, the new world that we are entering with COVID-19 and what's happening around us. Um, and for example, an IMF loan is being spoken about. But what this all means for things like, uh, or grand schemes like uh, EWC or uh, the NHI, um, what, what do you see on the horizon now under these new circumstances for those grand plans? Yeah, so I think we're going to have this this big battle over that. So uh, the South African Communist Party has produced their their views on what should be done, which is don't take money from the IMF um, and let's proceed with radical economic transformation and uh, you know let's let's embrace the wonderful ideas of Lenin and Marx. Um, as I say, you know, crises create opportunities for bad actors. Now I've been a very outspoken opponent of EWC for a long time. Um, uh, what I've said is that it's, it will be catastrophic for our economy, um, that uh, it, will, it will cause so much damage, um, it, will, it will wind up in a sort of you know, the horrible situation that Venezuela and Zimbabwe have found themselves in. Uh, even more so now, we are going to be entering uh, an economy that is so much more fragile. Um, if you think about you know, who's traditionally been targeted by EWC, it's this idea of, of farmers. Well, farmers are going to become the backbone of our new South Africa. In other words, they're going to secure, you know, our food. Uh, we definitely don't want to be targeting them and depriving them of of, of their land. Um, so, you know, I think it's now more than ever we need to be opposing expropriation of compensation, and and hopefully the sort of um, the state sees that and abandons this this uh, this dangerous idea, which has become even more dangerous now. Hmm. Well, I can only say that if I look at the the screeching that's going on on social media from uh, online revolutionaries when it comes to the IMF loan. I was a bit unsure about it. I had my doubts, but now I'm pretty much, I'm warming to the idea of an IMF loan, just looking at the at the reaction, it seems. Um, but then if we now look at uh, South Africa in that regard, 
do you think uh, when you look at, for example, the if we get the IMF loan rather than going, for example, to the BRICS bank, do you think this will radically uh, change the ANC's course? And do you think they will adhere to something like this, for example? Or do you think uh, we might actually not get such a loan, even if we attempt so, seeing as we're going to stand in line now with 20 other countries also with their hands in a bowl uh, gesture? Yeah, from what I understand, there's sort of different funds that have been set up. So let's say there was the traditional um, balance of payments crisis that countries would find themselves in. So for example, if you had a, a currency collapse um, and you owed people money in dollars and were unable to pay it because your own native currency had collapsed, IMF could step in and help you through this crisis. And that would come with some strings attached. So um, kind of um, neoliberal reforms, so protecting property rights, um, protecting markets. Um, and so there's some... Uh, you know, resistance from the revolutionaries because they don't want to adopt free market principles and they don't want to have strings from the IMF. Um, and so that's why they don't like it. Um, but it's a way to have positive structural reforms. But I gather that the COVID funds might not come with those same strings. Um, so, you know, that's where we might find that the ANC is happy to take money from the IMF, um, provided that they, you know, can kind of keep their own agendas in place. So that's something worth keeping an eye on. But I think you're right to point out that we're suddenly in a situation where, let's say before, we could have gone to the IMF and they said, well, there's money available, but now you have the whole world with their hands out, there might be a lot less money available. Mm. And uh, something as well that uh, I think that is affecting increasing the amounts of South Africans, uh, seeing as there is a, a ban now on, on alcohol sales, but also it seems on brewing alcohol. Um, I saw a headline, uh, I think yesterday, that uh, the producers of brewing yeast are going to cease uh, creating or supplying that to shops. And you can just imagine what type of pressure led to this, or maybe they're just doing it out of the goodness of their hearts and their concern for their civic concern. Um, what, and now the broader theme there is, um, what are your personal views or your impressions of the corporations in South Africa, the big, the big dogs of the private sector of South Africa, how they've reacted to this. And can we, from a law perspective, expect to see something uh, in the works there, maybe down the pipeline from that side, from the private sector? Yeah. So I think we have a history in South Africa of, um, you know, business closing up to government, regardless of who the government is, you know, um, that I think especially those that um, want to have a relationship with government, they'll just say, we'll be obedient, we'll follow the orders, whatever you want from us, three cups full, you know. Um, and there's something dangerous about that because often government has some pretty bad ideas um, and you want business to be able to kind of flex its muscles and point that out. So, for example, on expropriation and compensation, you know, um, big business has been appalling. Um, you know, they haven't pointed out, you know, how dangerous this would be for the economy, for themselves. You know, they've often been happy to sort of um, sacrifice their shareholders' interests or, you know, um, interests of other citizens for some sort of short-term gain by being able to cozy up with government. And this yeast thing is interesting. So, you know, it's not so much the idea that bothers me about people not being able to brew beer at home. It's the idea that there was this immediate acceptance to say, we are so sorry for having offended our overlords um, and we will not sell our brewing yeast anymore. We'll continue to sell our baking yeast because, you know, that people can make bread for and that's a wholesome activity but obviously making beer in your own home well we understand why government doesn't like it and no problem we'll just pull the product um that shows no backbone um and it is not the right stance to be taken again one must ask what is the concern with someone making their own beer at home you know to my mind there is none you know i've had friends who made their own beer for a long time it's sort of a fun thing that they could do um you know it's it's not necessarily the same as like making your own moonshine, which might make you go blind. Um, but, you know, uh, yeah, I, th I think, I mean, ima imagine, you know, given that we have a, a prohibition on, on hot foods, if people who sold ovens and other heating equipment said, well, we don't think that citizens should be allowed to use our product because then they can make hot food at home. And we know that's not essential anymore because the government has declared as such. You know, we think that was utterly absurd. Um, so now the, the second part of that question, do you reckon we can see, we will see uh, big court cases coming from, for example, the tobacco or the, the alcohol industry in the future regarding this? Yes. Yeah, so it, it looked like there were early threats from a liquor body um, to try and to try and challenge it. And that's, um, they gave, uh, I think it is a deadline of the 14th of April. And Ron Pauza said, look, give me more time. I'll let you know by the 17th. And on the 17th said, no, 
uh, not gonna not gonna change the prohibition of alcohol. Uh, and we've yet to see the case being launched. Um, now, there's a couple of reasons to be sort of supportive of liquor. The one is um, it employs a large number of people. I think um, the beer industry supports 250,000 jobs directly. There's all these indirect jobs, all these people who you know um, work in marketing for beer and design labels and you know all the logistics guys and you know, all those people who could be selling this product and who require beer as a livelihood. Um, so that that could have you know enormous economic damages. You know, I think the problem is, uh, and I saw in the comments someone made this point about well, if people stop drinking, it will it'll mean that more hospital beds are available. And I do understand that, you know, that uh, you know traditionally people getting into bar fights or you know um, you know drunk driving has filled up hospital beds. But there are other measures in place which are going to stop that. In other words, we don't have these big public gatherings, we don't have people driving, so people consuming liquor at home. Well, maybe you have a couple more, you know, people wanting in hospital. Um, but it's there are no solutions, only trade-offs. And if we sort of siphon off the liquor industry on the basis that we can save a couple of lives, then we're going to lose all these lives because of the economic consequences. So we have to look at both sides of it. Um, I, I've started a, a little um, philosophy show um, called Brain in a Vat. And uh, the first episode that I've done with Dr. Jason Werbelov, who's quite a prominent philosopher, is on the trolley problem and on COVID. Um, and I, in that I explore some of the the kind of choices that have to be made um, when you have a lockdown and the sort of you know the balancing of lives and the balancing of the economy and how these these problems are much more interrelated than we'd like to admit on what platform is this podcast available so uh, we've got a youtube channel which is uh brain and a bat um, and we've also um, got a podcast which is available on spotify and you know your other favorite ways of listening to the audio also brain and a bat um i'll i'll send you a link and uh, you can disseminate it if you like yeah, I'll, I'll put it in the in the description for anyone interested. If you are watching this, uh, not watching this live, it is definitely in the description. I'll put it in after the after the show. So there's something else I saw today that really kind of it it piqued my interest, but I don't I have no idea how it would work. And I would maybe maybe you can enlighten us a little bit here. So I don't know if you saw this. Um, so coronavirus, Missouri sues Chinese government over the virus handling. And it breaks my brain a little bit in the sense in I really don't know how this would work, what this would entail. And I know the law differs from country to country. Uh, you, your focus is South African law. But I think you are in a better position than me to be able to explain maybe just what would, how would this work? How would an American state be able to sue uh, a, a foreign government? Uh, are there any historical precedents for this? Yes, so I can give you one that springs to mind, which is um, cases brought against Iran. So um, there were American citizens who had family members uh, in Israel um, who were killed through terrorist attacks, which were ultimately funded by Iran. Um, and they've brought um, litigation against the government of Iran. And what they've done is that they've seized assets that are um, in America and owned by uh, by Iran, so embassies, embassy cars, things like that. Um, and so they've had to, they're quite innovative ways of being able to get out their awards. Um, so look, you've still got to kind of meet the, the threshold for, um, you know, for wrongfulness and for, you know, showing that you have a, a delict. So in South African law, at least, um, you've got to show that either the other side acted negligently um, and um, caused you the harm um, and did so in a manner that was wrongful um, or that they did it intentionally. So American tort law kind of mirrors the African law in some ways. Um, it's probably not a simple case to prove. We do know that the Chinese government um, was not very forthcoming originally about um, the risks of the virus, even though they knew information. Um, and they clearly have caused harm to countries all around the world. Um, it's not clear they did it intentionally, but um, you know, there might be a case to be made out that it was negligent. And so we may very well find um, that there will be some litigation around it. Um, and it's, you know, it, it is possible that, um, you know, it could be acted upon because I think the Chinese government has many assets in America. Um, and uh, if they are successful in litigation, that they would, that the states could then claim um, rights against those assets. Right. So, uh, well, firstly, uh, I would just like to thank again everyone that tuned in. Uh, we're approaching the end now. And before I give Mark uh, his time to give us some final thoughts, uh, my final question actually uh, is 
just maybe if you have a, a little crystal ball there and you look forward into what we are seeing, I think we are living in very uncertain, a very uncertain time. Nobody really can predict. It seems like all it seems to be a very perilous time to make predictions. But just maybe in a broad sense, um, what can you see, especially now from a legal angle, transpire in the in the weeks and months that to come? What are things to be there? Let me rather ask it this way. What are areas that should that you think people should be uh, being attentive to or should be keeping an eye on as it, when it comes to South African or constitutional law in regards to the lockdown in the coming weeks and months? Okay, yeah, it's a good question. So I think partly um, fortune telling is a dangerous exercise, but scenario planning is not. So I think being able to envisage different scenarios is going to be very useful so that we know in advance you know, which track we're heading down. So the Institute for Race Relations often very keen on the strategy and they've sort of done that kind of forecasting for a number of years where they say, look, South Africa could be going down one of these four paths. Um, and they look at sort of that, they've been looking at traditionally from an economic perspective and a, and a social authoritarian perspective. So I think that's a, a useful rubric. Um, I think we're going to find, there's some things that are inevitable. We're going to have um, some serious economic problems. Um, you know. You, as you mentioned, if you freeze an economy, you can't just you know thaw it out and everything goes back. You know either you have the sort of loss of limbs from the cryogen, or that it's really that you put it in the cupboard and it rotted and it's no longer there anymore, um, and that has catastrophic consequences, uh, which will then have further consequences. So uh, I, I think we also need to, as I say, be vigilant about restrictions on our rights. Um, that I think. Um, What's, what citizens ought to be doing is looking at those kinds of court challenges uh, that should be supported and either supporting it financially because some people have the good idea of running litigation but they don't have the funds. Um, so I gather people will probably start running crowdfunding campaigns to challenge the more pernicious regulations. And I think identifying those to support is important. And identifying those uh, civil society organizations that are fighting the good fight you know, to ensure that our rights are respected. Um, so I, I think, you know, um, that, that's going to be quite important for me to play an active role. Um, and, um, and I think at some point we have to recognize that this health crisis will come to an end. It will not be indefinite. If we look back in history and you know, we think about the Spanish flu, you know, the Spanish flu was you know, catastrophic in a lot of ways and a bit forgotten. Um, so they reckon that 25% of the world's contracted the Spanish flu and that between 50 and 100 million people lost their lives. Um, and that was in 1918 and sort of, you know, the tail end of the First World War. Um, but the world recovered. You know, economies you know, came back to normal. We headed into the roaring 20s. Um, so, you know, we must recognize that we will one day have a free world and we need to kind of plan for that so that we can ensure that, you know, we don't go into a world that is deeply authoritarian um, and dystopian. We need to ensure that our freedoms are granted back to us. No, I think I completely agree there. I think people just need to be vigilant and you mentioned it earlier um the price of freedom is p uh, persistent vigilance and we have a one of your big fans in the chat mark uh, quentin ferreira says cc please tell mark i think he's a national treasure thanks quentin i, I saw you bump jump on the chat and i just wanted to say you know i think the same quentin does some fantastic work um you know really bright wonderful guy um and uh you know i think you know cares about south africa from abroad um and uh you know the more south africans we have like quinton the better mm. and i think well he's been uh, he's been on three times now he holds the record for most guest appearances on the show so i think i can call him a friend of the show that's what a lot of the uh the more prestigious uh podcasts that they have recurring <laughs> recurring guests they hand out that label but uh yes uh now before we we uh, tell people where they can reach you mark do you have any final thoughts uh that won't take uh, an hour and a half because i think uh, there's so much to say in terms of uh, ending such a good conversation but maybe a nice condensed way of pretty much giving people a final thought to take away from this uh, leading into so ramaphosa's address later tonight yeah so i'll say something which i think you've echoed as well which is that this is a trying time for people um and it's a test of our characters and um you know i think what we want to try and do is let the virtuous parts of ourselves come out during this time that we want to try and be kind generous and wise as opposed to you know um selfish and panicked and fearful um and that's not always going to be easy and it's not always going to be uh, clear what the right thing is to do um but i do think that difficult times can bring out the best in people um, and can make them stronger i think this is something that we will be you know 
that will echo for a long time. You know that we will be talking talking about this time to our children and grandchildren, um, and we want to try and you know lead meaningful and important lives while we can. I think that's a very excellent way to end it. Uh, Mark, uh, thank you very much for for joining me to have this very enlightening chat. Always a pleasure. Um, just maybe a final thing. Where can people reach you? I mean, you've mentioned your podcast now, but there, there are probably other places as well if they want to see where you just uh, throw some thoughts out there. Yeah, so if you're interested in seeing some of the things that I've written and some of the cases that I've been involved in, uh, you can have a look at my work website, which is uh, bridgeadvocates.coza, um, and you'll see a list of all the advocates that are in our group, um, and I've got a page which lists a lot of the articles that I've written and a lot of the other podcast appearances and video interviews that I've done over time. All right, excellent. And then uh, also, thank you very much, everyone, for tuning in. Uh, I hope you are not too disappointed with what is announced later tonight. Uh, remember to to smash that like button. It helps out the show a lot. If you're not subscribed yet, uh, maybe consider that. It's always nice to, to have as big an audience as possible so we can get as many thoughts in the chat that I can actually relay to the guests. I always get excellent, uh, not only questions, but also banter in the chat. I really thoroughly enjoy it. But yeah, guys, uh, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for giving us, uh, taking some time out of your day, Mark, to enlighten us on some more, uh, the more serious matters when it comes to the law aspect of the lockdown. And I, I hope you are washing your hands and staying safe and clean and, and healthy and all the best for the future. Excellent. Uh, lovely to chat and we'll do it again soon. Mm, all right. Uh, cheers, guys. Have a good one.